In this tutorial, we go into the next major section of the book of Romans, which we call Righteousness Vindicated Israel. And we're talking about God's dealings with Israel as a nation, which was a very important thing in the first century. Now, the first thing I want to do is just to show you a Word document of the text of Romans 9 through 11, just to let you know that this section truly is about Israel. I'm not going to read all this for the sake of time, but Paul talks about his brethren, his kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, Israel, Abraham's descendants, Jews, them, the sons of Israel, posterity, they, them, their, themselves, they. And so all of these words that are highlighted, these are pronouns that refer to Israel. Uh, in the next section, Israel, you, disobedient, obstinate people, remnant, Israel, them, my fellow countrymen, them, uh, natural branches, they. And so when you look at Romans 9 through 11, please understand that this is a literary section and it's important, in fact, very important when interpreting this passage to see it as a literary unit. And so this section is about Israel. And what Paul is going to say, and I'm giving a brief overview here to kind of set a trajectory. What Paul is going to say is that he has great sorrow for his kinsmen who are Israelites. In chapter 9, he says he has great sorrow. In chapter 10, his prayer is for their salvation. And so Paul has great concern for them because specifically they have been temporarily set aside in the program of God. God has turned from the Jew and he's focused on the Gentiles in this age. And we'll look at this later on in chapter 11, but I want to go ahead and say that now so we understand where he's going. In fact, Paul says at a future time, God will resume his program with Israel. Romans 9 through 11 then is a vindication of God's dealings with Israel. Someone could rightfully ask the question, how could God not keep his promises with Israel? Is God a just God, a righteous God? And Paul says, in fact, it's not as though God's word has failed. So he wants to lay to rest those fears when someone might falsely come to the conclusion that God had broken his promises to Israel. So this section is about Israel. Now, addressing God's faithfulness to Israel. The question about Israel surfaced in Romans 3 with minimal explanation. It was in that passage that Paul said that there's no distinction between Jew or Gentile. And the question was raised, what advantage does the Jew have? And Paul gave it a brief response. He says, much in every way. To them were committed the oracles or the promises of God. So there were advantages of being a Jew, but Paul didn't explain that to any detail. Well, now Paul is going to give that topic a fuller treatment. And I think the textual, and maybe I should say the contextual clue as to why Paul would do this is that he has just stated that nothing can separate the elect from the love of God. If I'm reading that as a believer in the first century, the first question that would come to my mind is, what about Israel? Because Israel was God's elect people, and they had been separated, it appears, from the love of God. And so this is a very natural question that could be asked and answered, and that's what Romans 9 through 11 does. And so here's some Old Testament examples where God promised that Israel would never be separated. Isaiah 49, Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me and the Lord has forgotten me. And God's response, can a woman forget her nursing child? These may forget, but I will never forget you. And it would, it would be a rare occurrence for a nursing mother to forget her child. In fact, a, a nursing mother, her body reminds her that she has a child that does need to be nursed. And yet, even if a nursing mother would forget her child, God says he would not forget Israel. Also, Isaiah 54, God says, The mountains may be removed and the hills may shake, but my loving kindness, Hebrew it's chesed, is God's covenant loyal love. He says, My chesed will not be removed from you and my covenant of peace will not be shaken. And God appeals to the covenant love that He has for Israel as a guarantee that Israel would not be separated from the love of God. And then finally in Jeremiah 31, Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night. 
If this fixed order departs from before me, then the offspring of Israel shall cease from being a nation before me forever. And so my point is, and this is just a, a small smattering of examples, that God has made several promises to Israel that they would always be His people, that He would not forget them, so to speak. And so with that being said, Paul tells believers in Romans 8 that they'll never be separated from the love of God. He has to address the issue of God's faithfulness to Israel. And here's why. If God doesn't keep His promises with Israel, how do we know that God will keep His promises with us? And so Romans 9 through 11 becomes a very relevant passage of Scripture for all believers because it's only as God is faithful to Israel that we can also have certainty that God is faithful to us. And his thesis, the answer he gives before he gives the explanation of it, is found in 9 verse 6. It is not as though the Word of God has failed. So before he explains himself, Paul says, regardless of what it looks like, God's Word, His promises to Israel have not failed. And that's going to set the stage for the rest of what he says in this very important section of Scripture. And so let's move through this. So the first thing that Paul does is he talks about the fact that God is just in setting Israel aside. He shows in chapter 9 verses 6 through 29 that God is just. God was just when He chose Isaac instead of Ishmael. God was just when He chose Jacob instead of Esau. God was just when He hardened Pharaoh and He showed mercy to Israel. And now too, God is just when He's showing mercy to Gentiles and He has hardened the Israelites. So God is just in setting Israel aside. After He proves that, then he's going to go on to say that God, in fact, had a reason to set Israel aside. It wasn't just an arbitrary choice of sovereignty, but in fact, it was because of Israel's unbelief. And so he did have a reason to set Israel aside. Then he's going to go on to show us that there's still a remnant of believing Jews. So Jews haven't been rejected wholesale. There still is a remnant of believing Jews. And God is using this time period of Israel's fall to mean salvation to the Gentiles. And the final point here is that Israel has not been set aside forever. Paul's going to show that God will yet resume His program with Israel. All Israel will be saved. It's important for us to keep these pieces together as we look at the larger section of 9 through 11 where Paul shows that God's promises to Israel have not failed. So let's move through this. Let's start with where Paul begins, and that is the tragedy of Israel's rejection. And this is Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. Paul says, I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. So Paul talks about the tragedy of Israel's rejection. It's seen in Paul's heart for his kinsmen. Paul says, I wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites. So Paul is talking about Jewish people who don't believe in Christ and Paul's heart is sorrowful for them to the point that he says he wishes, if possible, he could be accursed for them. And so we see the tragedy of Israel's rejection in Paul's heart for his kinsmen, and it is amplified in light of the privileges that they possessed. He mentions these in verses 4 and following. He says, first of all, to whom belong the adoption as sons. This takes us back to Exodus chapter 4, where God says that Israel is my firstborn son. They were a chosen possession of the Lord. And so Paul says that they have the adoption as sons. Also the glory. And the glory talks about God's Shekinah glory, the presence of God that was manifest first at the tabernacle and, and, and uh, resting on the tabernacle there and then later on in the temple. And it was indicative of God's favor and His presence and His protection. To them belong the glory. Not only that, but he says also the covenants. And the covenants would be the Abrahamic covenant that God gave them the land forever. The Mosaic where He promised a regathering and a regeneration of the nation. 
the Davidic, where he promised a Davidic descendant would reign forever, and the new covenant where God promised to give them a new heart. These are covenants that God made with Israel. And I want you to see that Paul looks at unbelieving Israelites and he says these covenants belong to them. And so it is something that they should anticipate in the future. He also mentions the giving of the law. And of course, this speaks about the fact that out of all the nations, Israel alone possessed God's special revelation. As Psalm 147 says, He shows His word to Jacob, His precepts and His judgment to Israel. And you have that also that He says, to them belong the fathers. This speaks of the patriarchs that Israel came from. Deuteronomy 10, The Lord your God, to Him belong heaven and the heavens of heavens, the earth and all that is in it. Yet the Lord set His heart and His love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them. And so there are all these privileges that Israel has. The glory, the covenants, the, the fathers. And then He says the law, the temple service, and the promises. All these things belong to them. And ultimately from them is the Christ who is God blessed forever. Amen. And so all these privileges that Israel had, they put them in a great position to know God and to glorify Him. But instead of them taking advantage of these privileges, by and large, they turned their table into a snare. As Paul will say later on in chapter 11, they stumbled over the stumbling stone. And so you have the tragedy of Israel's rejection seen in Paul's heart for his kinsmen, amplified in light of the privileges that they possessed. Now we look at the justice of Israel's rejection. So how is it that God can set them aside and maintain faithfulness to His promises? And Paul's going to deal with this, first of all, by showing that physical descent does not guarantee that one will inherit the promises of God. Look with me in chapter 9, verse 6. Paul says, It is not as though the Word of God has failed. In light of all these promises and privileges, God's Word did not fail. And his explanation is simply this. They are not Israel who are descended from Israel. They are not all Israelites who are descended from the man Israel. In other words, Paul is beginning to talk about an Israel within Israel, a remnant. And he says they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants, but through Isaac your descendant will be named. And so one can be a biological child of Abraham and not be a recipient of the promise and God is still faithful to His Word. To develop that, Paul talks about Isaac and Ishmael. Verse 8, It is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of promise are regarded as descendants. Speaking of Isaac, verse 9, This is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but there was Rebekah also. And so he's going to go on to talk about Jacob and Esau in just a second. But he shows that one can be a physical descendant of Abraham, as Ishmael was, and not inherit the promise of God. Ishmael was an example. He wasn't a child of promise. He was a biological child. And no one would accuse God of failing to keep His promise to Abraham when God chose to keep that with Isaac instead of Ishmael. And so uh, one can be a physical descendant and not inherit the promise of God. Some might argue, yeah, but that's two different mothers. And so Paul goes a step further and he uses Jacob and Esau as examples. Verse 10, not only this, but there was Rebekah also, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. Though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to choice would stand, not because of works, but of Him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I have hated. And so I want to pause and talk about that for a second. I want you to see this, that according to custom, Esau was the one in the rightful place for blessing, and Jacob had no claim on that. It was the firstborn who was supposed to be blessed. And the one who was in the rightful place didn't receive it, and the one who had no claim on it did receive it, and that was God's freedom of choice in that matter. 
And if you think about the larger context of what's happening in the first century, when Paul is addressing the Romans, the ones in the rightful place for blessing didn't get it, the Jews. And the one who had no claim on it did, the Gentiles. And God is free to do that because He's God. And so he says again, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I have hated. God did this because He has a right to choose who will be the recipients of His promises, whom He desires to bless. And Paul is using individuals, but he's using individuals to speak about God's dealings with Israel and Gentiles. And so the larger context shows that God is free to do this, yes, on an individual level, and He is in fact doing this on a national level with Israel and reaching out to Gentiles with the gospel. Well, not only do you have Ishmael and not only do you have Esau, but you have another example here with Pharaoh. Verse 14, the natural question that would arise when God chose to bless Isaac, when God chose to bless Jacob. God chose who was going to be the recipients of the promises, where His path would travel in, in history here. And, and by the way, I do want to say this, that if you read Genesis, Ishmael wasn't reprobated to hell. And Esau wasn't reprobated to hell. It was a matter of who was going to carry the covenant promises. And, and so with that being said, the question still would naturally arise, what shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. You get this emphasis of the freedom of God, and the question is, is God being unjust? Is God just doing what He wants to do, and is that okay? And Paul says, God can do this, verse 15. He says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Now, the context of this is Exodus 33, and this is where Israel has worshipped the golden calf, and Moses comes off the mountain, and, and he's angry with them, and God says he's not going to go on personally with Israel, but he'll send his angel before them. And Moses begs God to accompany them, and he begs God for assurance that he will accompany them. And God does show Moses his glory as a sign that he's going to go with the nation. And God says this in that context, he says, I will show mercy to whom I show mercy. And the idea is that God is showing mercy to Israel, not because they deserve it, but because God is a gracious God. And so the question that Israel would have to grapple with in the first century is this. Is it okay for God to show mercy to those who are undeserving of mercy? And of course, they would have to answer yes. That, that's exactly what God did with Israel at the beginning of the nation when God constituted them a nation and, and led them out of slavery in Egypt. And so, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. Paul says in verse 16, it doesn't depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then, he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. This is an incredible reference here. I want to go to the book of Exodus just for a moment, just to develop this a little bit. But what God does in the Exodus is he demonstrates to all the world that he alone is God. Exodus chapter 6, verse 7, God says that He will take them for Him as a people. I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I bring you out from the burden of the Egyptians. And you have this theme of you will know that I am the Lord that's developed through the Exodus. Over in chapter 7, verse 17, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Chapter 7, verse 5, the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. Chapter 8, verse 10, that you may know that there is no one like the Lord your God. And it goes on and on through the Exodus account. And, and when it all took place, at the end of the day, when the spies went into Jericho, you remember what Rahab said? 
She said, we heard about what your God did, how he dried up the Red Sea. And when we heard this, our hearts melted with fear because your God is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. God's name was declared throughout the earth. And the reason God's name was declared throughout the earth is because God hardened Pharaoh he solidified Pharaoh in his decision to rebel. He locked him into his choice. And when that took place, we have not one plague, not two plagues, but ten plagues. And because we have ten plagues, God made a mockery of the gods of Egypt, and His name was proclaimed throughout the whole earth. And so back in Romans chapter 9, verse 17, he says, For this purpose, Pharaoh, I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. And indeed it was. And so Paul's conclusion, verse 18, God has mercy on whom He desires and He hardens whom He desires. So think about this. Let's just picture being a Jew in the first century, a Jewish believer, and knowing that God has turned His attention away from the Jews and towards the Gentiles. And you're struggling with this. How is it okay for God to harden the Jews and to show mercy to the Gentiles? And Paul, in essence, is telling them that by their own theology, they must agree to this. He would ask them, is it okay for God to show mercy to whom He desires? He showed mercy to Israel. He can show mercy to Gentiles. Is it okay for God to harden whom He desires? God hardened Pharaoh. No Jew would have difficulty with that. But when the tables are reversed and God is hardening Israel, it was a hard thing to deal with. And so Paul says, He has mercy on whom He desires and He hardens whom He desires. And this again, in the larger context of God setting Israel aside and turning His attention towards the Gentiles. So we see that God is free in the exercise of His mercy and His judgment. In fact, we see this here in verses 17 and 18. Pharaoh, again, as this example of God hardening whom He desires. Israel is an example of God showing mercy to whom He desires. Now the tables are turned. God is showing mercy to Gentiles, and He has hardened the nation of Israel. And so, Paul moves into the next aspect of this argument, and he shows a defense of God's freedom, that God is God, and He can do what He wants to do, and that's always going to be consistent with God's nature and His character. Look with me in verses 19 and following. Paul anticipates the question. He says, You will say to me then, Why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? And, and the question that's being asked it appears like someone who sees themselves as a helpless pawn as God is moving the chess pieces to accomplish His purposes. And Paul's first answer is this. He says, On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? And the way Paul frames this is he's trying to put man in his place. Who are you, O man? He reminds them, you're just a human being and he's God. So be careful with the questions that you ask. Who are you, O man, who answers back to God? And then he uses an analogy here. He says, will the thing molded say to the molder, why did you make me like this? And it goes with this example of a potter making pottery. And of course, it would be ludicrous for a piece of pottery to say, why did you make me like this? God is the potter and the potter has freedom. And Paul wants the objector to know that, that God is free in the exercise of his mercy and his judgment. God is God and we are not. And so he is free. God is free. A defense of God's freedom. Let's go on with this a bit further. He says in verse 21, Does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? And you know what? That's exactly what God did with Israel. Out of the clay of humanity, God made one lump for honorable use, Israel, and everything else was common. And if God wants to do that now in a different way, He is able to do that. He has freedom. He is the potter and we're the clay. So Paul now begins to answer in another way this objection. The question is again, why does God find fault who resists His will? His first answer is, you're man, He's God, He's the potter, you're the clay, so let's just get that straight first. But now he goes on to explain. 
He says, What if God, although willing to demonstrate His wrath and to make His power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Now, this brings to mind a couple of images. First of all, there's Egypt and there's Pharaoh. And God demonstrated His wrath and He made His power known through Pharaoh. And what if, Paul says, God wanted to do that? And in this context, He's looking at Israel. If God wanted to, He could have demonstrated His wrath to Israel. But in fact, God is forbearing His wrath in order to show mercy. And so in essence, Paul is saying, yes, God is free, God is God, but God is not dealing too severely with Israel in the sense that there's no opportunity for mercy. God is actually showing mercy to Israelites. He is withholding wrath in order to show mercy. And so he says, he demonstrates his wrath, he makes his power known, endured with much patience, vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. Now, I want to make a couple of comments here. Uh, first of all, with this concept of vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, uh, I want you to catch this, that this is not a fixed quantity, at least not the way I understand it. And the reason I say that. If you read Ephesians chapter 2, Paul's going to talk about vessels of wrath or children of wrath. And Paul at one time saw himself as being a child of wrath who is now a child of God. And so you have vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. These would be unbelieving Israelites. And God is holding back wrath in order to show mercy. He did so to make known the riches of His glory upon vessels of mercy, which He prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom He also called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. And I believe Paul is alluding to a remnant of believing Jews that God has uh, shown mercy to, and now they are prepared beforehand for glory, but it's not just believing Jews, it's also believing Gentiles, even us whom He called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. He gives theological backing of this in verse 25. As He says in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people, my people. And I will call her who was not beloved, beloved. And it shall be said in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people. There they shall be called the sons of the living God. This is a beautiful quote in Hosea. And it's speaking about how Israel had gone from being God's people to being rejected. And God said he would call them once again his people. But the amazing thing is that Paul applies this here to Gentiles because of a point of similarity, not my people, now becoming the people of God. But concerning Israel, verse 27, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it will be a remnant that will be saved. For the Lord will execute His work on the earth thoroughly and quickly. And just as Isaiah foretold, unless the Lord of Sabaoth or the Lord of heaven's armies had not left to us a remnant, we would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. And so what Paul states here in this section is the justice of Israel's rejection. And he shows that physical descent does not guarantee one will inherit the promises of God. He also shows that God is free in the exercise of His mercy and judgment. No one would accuse God of breaking His promises to Abraham when God showed mercy to Isaac instead of Ishmael, to Jacob instead of Esau, nor should they say that in Paul's day. There's a defense of God's freedom. He can show mercy to whom He desires and He can harden whom He desires because He's God. He's the potter and we're the clay. And yet there's a flavor of God's mercy in this and that even though God is willing to show His wrath, He's actually holding back wrath in order to show mercy, not just to Jews, but also to Gentiles who come to faith in Jesus. 